As we tell Mary's story from the end to the beginning, we come to Luke 2, 41 to 51. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. This is the word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As we look at the Christmas story during this sermon series, Through the Eyes of Mary, you'll know if you've been with us at all that we've started at the end and we're working our way back to the beginning. So today we're stopping at a fascinating story for any number of reasons. There's a 30-year gap between the dedication of Jesus in the temple as a little infant and his baptism in the River Jordan where we don't know anything about him except this story. It's the only story from his childhood. Verse 41 includes the first recorded words of our Lord. The last time we Read about Joseph being alive is in this story. So he must have died somewhere between this occurrence in the temple and when Jesus began his public ministry. It's the first time we know of that Jesus claimed his special relationship with God. Mary was in her mid-twenties at this time. Why did she want this story, this particular one, out of all the stories that had happened during his early years? Why did she want this one told? Let us pray. We hear, Lord, that Mary cherish, she treasured what happened in the temple in her heart. May we treasure the story, hearing it in a way that we want to know more than just about the story, but we want to know about us in the story. Amen. Wouldn't you have loved to know more about Jesus' early years when he was a child? There are some writings, uh, extant writings, about what might have happened during those years. None of them made it into the canon or our official uh, gospel. There's even a book entitled The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. It was written in the late 20, uh, second century. And it uh, details uh, about an eight-year period in Jesus' life from the time he was five until he was 12. Here he's portrayed mainly as a miracle worker. As an example, at five, 
He makes birds out of mud. He claps his hands and makes them fly away. Let me share with you out of that gospel. And he made clay. He molded 12 sparrows from it. And it was the Sabbath when he did these things. But there were also many other children playing with him. Then a certain Jew saw what Jesus was doing while playing on the Sabbath. Immediately he departed and reported to Jesus' father, Joseph. Look, your child is in the stream, and he took clay and formed twelve birds and profane the Sabbath. And Jesus went to the area, and when he saw him, he shouted, Why are you doing these things that are not permitted on the Sabbath? Jesus, however, clapped his hands and shouted to the sparrows, Depart, fly, and remember me now that you are alive. And the sparrows departed, shrieking. When the Jews saw this, they were amazed, and they had gone, and after they had gone away, they described to their leaders what they had seen Jesus do. There's another story where Jesus is helping his father in the carpenter shop, and they needed a particular uh, plank of wood, a certain size, and all they had was a short one, and uh, Jesus touched it, and it became the right length. Those are the kind of stories that were in the infancy gospel of Thomas. Of course, we have only this one from Luke. But why again just this one? When you think about Mary's life and you think about what occurred when he was 12 years old, 12 years old was a formative time for Jewish males. Uh, now it's about 13 when, we, when males and females go through their bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. But it was a coming into your, it was a transition into being a, an adult. For every adult Jewish male, uh, if you were within a reasonable traveling distance, you were supposed to come to the temple as many as three times a year for the three main festivals. The first one is the festival of Passover, which really define the Jews as a nation because it commemorated the time of being delivered from slavery in Egypt. Then there was the Passover of Pentecost, or the, the festival of Pentecost and the festival of Tabernacles. This may have been the first time that Jesus himself as a boy came to Jerusalem, uh, and obviously his mother was along. And what the way they did, they were traveling about uh, 10 hours from Nazareth. Um, well, actually, it would, it, it, that's when the, this uh, occurrence happened when they realized that Jesus wasn't there on the way back. But it was about a three-day trip uh, to Nazareth, about 10 miles. But they went in a caravan, and... Along with them were family and friends. It was a large gathering of people as they walked to Jerusalem. They get to Jerusalem, and they, uh, they spend about seven days there. Now, most 12-year-old boys probably, and I assume Jesus was uh, not any different than 12-year-olds today. 12-year-olds are in uh, probably in the seventh grade today, and this is the time you're kind of separating yourself when, with, from your parents and uh, forming your own uh, independence. So I'm sure Jesus was hanging out with his friends, but somehow had made his way over to the temple, and we find him with the religious teachers, the rabbis of that day. After the festival, Joseph and Mary and the caravan are on their way back to Nazareth. And this is where they were about 10 hours away from uh, Jerusalem. And someone must have said, where's Jesus? And they begin, begin looking among their family and friends and they don't find him. So you can imagine the panic that must have set in with Mary. And they travel back to Jerusalem. 
Now, Jerusalem at the time of the Passover uh, greatly expands in size, four or five or six times the size. Usually about 50,000 people are in Jerusalem at any one time. Now there's going to be about 250 to 300,000 people. I'm sure the family knew a lot of folks that lived in Jerusalem, so they were going frantically from house to house, turning Jerusalem upside down. Mary had to be thinking, I was entrusted with the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and now we've lost Him. And then, our passage says, after three exhausting days, they were astonished. They were dumbfounded to find him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers. And then what did Mary see? Scripture says they were amazed at his understanding and his answers as he was interacting with the teachers. Back then and and still today in rabbinical education, uh, the value was placed not simply on the information that you possessed about God and Scripture, but the rabbis wanted to know how you internalized, how you owned, how you wrestled and understood the information, how the questions that you asked. This de- demonstrated how much you knew God. You just didn't know about God, but you knew God. And this little 12-year-old boy knew, knew the Heavenly Father. Somehow, in the education his parents had given him, Jesus had come to know and internalize who God was. And of course, as with any loving parents, uh, they, the first thing I'm sure they did was, was after embracing him and probably hugging him and kissing him, because they'd found him, they scolded him. Mary says, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And then we hear Jesus' voice for the first time ever. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Verse 50 says that they did not understand what he had said to them. How could they have? Even with the angels' voices still ringing in their hearts. Uh, Remember the disciples spent three years with him, seeing all of these miracles and hearing all of these profound teachings. And yet they didn't understand. The story concludes with the obedient son returning with his parents to their hometown of Nazareth. And verse 51 says that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. That's why, friends, apparently unlike any other happening in Jesus' life, that's why Mary wanted this one to be told. The last verse of chapter 2 gives us this beautiful summary of our Lord's life from the age of 12 to about the age of 30. Because it says, as Jesus grew up, he increased in wisdom and stature, and he was loved by God and by all who knew him. So what does this story mean to us? As we try to internalize it. As we come to learn not just about God through this story, but we come to know God and how He wants us to order our lives because of this story. Well, I can tell you one of the things this story means to me and how it draws me closer to my Lord. There were many things that Jesus could have done that day in Jerusalem with his friends and with his family, but he chose to seek out the rabbis in the temple. 
It was Sabbath time for him, a time to rest with God. I need to force myself to rest with God, to reclaim a Sabbath time. The Lord is the, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, a time where I can not be concerned about accomplishing a darn thing from any list that I have. Why do I have to fight so hard to get through the Christmas season without getting sick, without getting a cold or without getting laryngitis, without ending up so fatigued that I can't fully enjoy Christmas Day? And most of the days between Christmas and New Year's. Ever been there? We live in a world where we're measured by the amount of work we get done. If there were just enough hours, we could accomplish more. And if we could work a a few extra shifts, we could make a little bit more money and it could have a, a good financial impact on our lives. And that is all true. But it also takes quite a toll on our lives, physically and spiritually. From the time of creation, God has told us of the value of rest. He could have gone on creating after six days, but God chose to rest on the seventh. And ever since the exodus from Egypt, God has commanded us, to find a time of Sabbath rest. He said that we all need to rest, that the animals need to rest, that the land needs to rest. This time is really sacred time. Religious scholars call it the sanctification of time, or to find this palace in time. I know one of the things I like to do And I really have to force myself to do it. When I come to church oftentimes on any given day, I have a list a mile long of things I need to get accomplished, and I'm always behind uh, the eight ball. But one of the things I first of all try to do, once I take my coat off, I, I I consider this Sabbath wandering. So I will wander down the hall, and a lot of times the, our Korean students will be having breakfast. They will have just been here from a 7 o'clock morning prayer service. And I'll just sit with them. And, and we'll interact. They show me such grace because they stop talking in Korean and they start talking in English. And I get to hear what's on their hearts. And I just bask in the moment. It becomes a Sabbath time. Sometimes I'll walk down. I don't do this enough, but I'll walk into the preschool area. And this week, as an example, they were all gathered around one of their teachers, and they were singing some Christmas carols. So I just sat down with them on the floor, and I just lived into that moment. I was told later on how much they appreciated that. And how blessed they were because I did that. And I, I thought the blessing was mine. And then I go back to my office, and invariably my heart is not heavy anymore. I don't feel the stress of the things that I have to accomplish. And then I approach them with a new spirit. And I think I'm a lot more efficient. And I think I do things a whole lot better when that happens which is one of the reasons we need to consider starting each day in meditation and prayer and to find these Sabbath times just as Jesus sought it in the temple that day. And you'll be amazed, you'll be astonished at what will happen in your life because you have allowed the Lord to be in that time. And you've allowed Jesus to be the Lord of your Sabbath. You can define it in any way that you want. 
I would encourage you, just as Jesus tried to tell Martha that day, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, you remember that story? That Martha, you worry about too many things that are heavy on your mind. When you're with me, just bask in my presence. All the other things will get done. And when you do, you'll do it with a new spirit and a new lightness of heart. It's not as if they, the things will go away. God, in a sense, creates time that you think is so elusive when you give Him some of your moments, give Him some of your heart that I love singing in the fourth verse of our hymn in the bleak midwinter. Rest in the Lord. One of my favorite poems that I want to share and close with is one by Wilford Arlen Peterson. It's sometimes been a Negro spiritual. And it's simply called, Slow Me Down, Lord. Maybe you've heard it. Slow me down, Lord. Ease the pounding of my heart by the quieting of my mind. Steady my hurried pace. Give me amidst the day's confusion the calmness of the everlasting hills. Break the tension of my nerves and muscles with the soothing music of singing streams that live in my memory. Help me to know the magical, restoring power of sleep. Teach me the art of taking minute vacations, slowing down to look at a flower, to chat with a friend, to read a few lines from a good book. Remind me of the fable of the hare and the tortoise, that the race is not always to the swift, that there is more to life than measuring its speed. Look, let me look up at the branches of the towering oak and know that it grew slowly and well. Inspire me to send my own roots down deep into the soil of life's enduring values that I may grow toward the stars of my greater destiny. Slow me down, Lord. Slow me down. Amen.